Mezun TV'den herkese merhaba. Bugün ikinci İVE Kongresi'nden size sesleniyoruz. Yanımda Profesör Stephen Chapman var. Kiel Üniversitesi'nde kendisi çok büyük yenilikleri imza atmış bir kişi. Hemen konuya gireceğim ve sanal hasta ve sanal gerçeklik üzerine yapmış oldukları hakkında kendisine bazı sorular soracağım. Welcome Dr. Chapman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We have watched you giving a great presentation on the use of technology on teaching medicine to medical students and uh, you talked about virtual patients and you talked about virtual reality. So if we come to virtual patients, how did this come up? What is the use of virtual patients in medical okay. e education? Well, the challenge for all healthcare professionals, not just medics, but pharmacists, nurses, pharmacists, physiotherapists, is we need to have increased clinical content in our courses. We need to understand how to interact with patients. So it's not the technical issues which you can learn in a classroom, it's how to deal with people, the emotional intelligence if you like. Now, the only way you can embed that with students is for them to practice. But the main challenges we have in getting our students to practice with patients are twofold. the standardization and there's access. So to still deal with the standardization issue first, the thing with standardization is, if we were to use real patients, which we do do, we bring patients into the university or we send our students out to the hospitals or to primary care clinics, and you take a group of six to 12 students, the first student will talk to the patient, they'll have an intelligent conversation, the patient will be receptive and willing to help. They usually do, they want to help train students. But then when you get to the second student, they get a little bit tired. And then the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, by the time you get to the seventh, eighth, ninth students, the patient is tired, they're bored, so they change the story a little bit. So by the time you get to the twelfth students, they have a completely different experience. So the joy of technology is, it never gets tired. Everybody has the same experience, so if you're assessing them, particularly for exams, everybody has the same experience, everybody is assessed the same way. Very important. The second issue is access. If I want to teach a student about hiatus hernia at two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, I have to be really sure there is somebody with hiatus hernia at two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. And again, that's not always possible. Maybe in a hospital setting where there's always a ward and you, you can usually find something interesting. But if you send somebody into the community and say, for a pharmacy student, we want you to look at hay fever, emergency contraception, and a migraine, they could stand there all day and a patient like that might not come in, which wastes everybody's time. So this way, they can access these cases to practice on themselves in their own time 24-7. Standardization and access are the main reasons you actually you wanted to create this avatar program. Absolutely. And the third, I suppose, underpinning all this is the ability to practice in a safe place. Make your mistakes in a virtual environment. Don't make them for real. So virtual reality is not a substitute for dealing with real patients, but it's an excellent way of preparing students to deal with real patients. So that means when you do have that precious time with students and patients, it's well spent. They know what they're doing when they're getting there. They can approach the patient properly, which is good for the student and it's good for the patient. And actually I've seen when you were presenting that there are different approaches. There is like the one that they can select from drop down when they're answering the patient during using the avatar program. And there's also a second one, which is a kind of a little bit, maybe we can say a little bit direct. And the third one is a kind of a little rude one. Yes. Right. The, the, we, the, we always, there are several ways of approaching this work. Um, the technology I showed at the conference uh, today was uh, asynchronous technology. That means that all the responses are pre-programmed in. So the student, the great advantage of this is the student can access it whenever. They just go on, the answers are there, they ask the right questions, they'll get the right answers. Mm -hmm. When I say the right answers, that comes in one of two ways. They can have a drop-down menu, so they can choose from the responses, and within those responses, as you quite rightly say, there'll be the ideal one, with technically correct and 
the emotional intelligence and the right the way through to the root one. Now importantly, uh, from a learning point of view, the avatar doesn't stop and correct the students. They carry on through the interview and they have to deal with the consequences of what they say. So if they ask a rude question, they'll get a rude response and then they have to deal with that and that will carry on till the interview closes. That's an artificial intelligence built in to the software, yeah, right? It's basically, it's a form of, I guess, yeah, yes. A form yeah. of basically it just knows uh, what type of answers and you have tried so many that you're actually including all of those different questions in there. And if there's anything missing, you already mentioned uh, that during your presentation, if anything is missing, let's say the avatar doesn't know the answer or could not recognize the question, then it goes back to your system administrators and uh, you can work it out then. Is that correct? That, that's correct. The system effectively learns. So if, um, if we have a free text response, which is not prompted, uh, you can type it in and a bit like Google search. You'll, you'll then get some suggested responses, but if it's not in there, the avatar will say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. That will go to our team back at the university and they'll look at that. If it's a sensible question, or if we've seen that question come up more than once, we'll think, hmm, okay, we have to deal with that. And so we can program it in. Usually, that's very straightforward because the answers don't really change. It's just the way you ask the questions. So a great example I could give you is we did some work um, with uh, some colleagues in Australia and we were doing something about uh, stomach disorders and we thought of all the questions which is how is your stomach today, do you have a tummy upset, all the usual sort of things. But what they say in Australia was I've got a crooked gut. Of course we didn't think to program that in that. <laughs> and it was the first thing that the student tried. So all we had to do is just bring down the drop down menu, type in the phrase crooked gut and then it responds appropriately. And from an academic's point of view, uh, you don't need to be a programmer to do this. It's just like dealing with an Excel spreadsheet. So you can go in, you type in your thing there, the system will recognize yeah, it. The database actually, basically. Yeah, and then it, and it just, it just, it just, yes, exactly. Yeah. It's a relation, relational like, database. Exactly. You also have a mobile application. Yes, we do. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about sure. that? Well, what we've talked about so far is um, training either undergraduates or qualified healthcare professionals. What we've looked at is using the same technology for helping patients understand more about their medicines. So what we've come up with is in collaboration with a local hospital and some, a local primary care group, uh, we had locally an issue with asthma. But lots of kids with quite severe asthma. Now when we spoke to the respiratory physicians, they said to us, Steve, um, the real issue we have here is when we sit down with these children and their parents, we talk to them about their asthma, we talk to them about their inhalers, uh, we spend time with them, we have a 20 minute consultation, which is a long time, um, but then they go away, a few days later, they're back in hospital again. And they're in and out of hospital, then in 12 weeks we see them again at the clinic, and we have the same conversation. There's something wrong, right? Yeah. And we keep having that same conversation over the course of two years. So somehow, maybe it's the environment they're in, they're in the hospital, they're in front of the doctor, the little tents, the information doesn't go in. What we wanted to do is provide something that would keep the children engaged. So we got a stakeholder group of children together and they selected an image and that image became the avatar. And then we asked them and their parents, what worried them about their asthma? What do they want to know about? What were their concerns? Which ranged right away from across to, you know, am I going to die to kind of play football to why is it called asthma? You know, uh, kids are great from that point of view. They're really honest. Yeah. It's just, so we, we assemble this into a, a big Markov model and match that with the evidence base and the SBC, the, the, the data for the product. Putting all this together then, what we can do is put a native app onto the phone. That's really important because you don't want to have something that's dependent on a good internet connection. Yeah? So you, of course you need it when you initially download it. So when the kids come to the clinic, we ask them if they want to be part of our support program. They say yes, they say great. Have you got your mobile phone with you or your, your, your tablet? Yeah, fine. While your medicine's being dispensed, we'll just download the app. It takes a minute, bang, it's in. And then when their inhaler is dispensed, we put a little QR code on the inhaler. Once the app's installed, you point your phone at the inhaler the avatar pops up on top of the inhaler and you start asking it questions. 
really engage the kids. We've only just started evaluating it, so one mustn't overclaim. But initial experience is very, very positive. And we've seen things that we weren't anticipating. So for instance, um, not only the kids using it, but the parents are using it. So when the kids are wheezing a lot, rather than panicking and taking them straight down to the hospital, they're going onto the app. Asking the question. Asking the question, think, that's okay. Two more puffs of the inhaler, then we'll go to the hospital if it doesn't settle down. So we're seeing less admissions to hospital, which is very important from a healthcare point of view. So, uh, is this application available in Turkey? Uh, not at the moment. We've got it licensed in the UK and we've only completed the pilot stage. But if there is some interest here, we'd be happy to make it, happy to make it available, yes. And when you said uh, native app, is it iPhone currently or both Android, iPhone? It works and across all platforms. All platforms, including Microsoft, iPhone, yep. Android. Uh, that's also uh, good news. So soon our viewers in Turkey can download this. We would be delighted if they did, and we hope it's helpful. Perfect. Uh, this is really a very good application to teach kids, actually, and parents about asthma and maybe cut their travel time to hospital. That would be. I mean, we're not stopping at asthma. Uh, it's gone so well locally that we're doing one now in diabetes and another one in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Oh, and we're hoping it's, to it's ongoing. Behind. So eventually we happen to have a whole suite of apps that will help. Great for kids, great for humanity, for you know, well, use, use of technology. So. The, the other nice development we've had is we originally started with having to put stickers on medicines so the app would recognize it. Now we can do it by photo recognition. Yeah, with so the code. Just, yeah, yeah, so we just, just use a code or something. So it needs a high resolution photograph of the original product. Scan it I see. and it will precipitate it. Pop up the avatar, yeah. like the, uh, is that an avatar also you call when yeah, it yeah, pops yeah, up? Yeah, the avatar image. It also ties in with a big new European initiative uh, called FMD, which is the Fraudulent Medicines Directive. So I think from spring next year, most pharmaceutical manufacturers are going to have to print a 2D barcode on the packet of medicine oh. to show that it's not counterfeit and it'll have to be scanned. Nice. Yeah, because that's there's a big problem with counterfeit. Starting next spring, you're yeah, saying. Yeah. So that same 2D barcode, as well as proving the authenticity of the medicine, could be used to trigger an avatar. Is and that we're a Europe? to talk to pharmaceutical companies about doing that. That is amazing. Is that a European Union thing, do you think? Or it is. It's European it's Union. It's European Union, I see. Yeah. I see. Now, Professor Chapman, I would like to ask you uh, another very, very exciting. Uh, project which is you call it cave the virtual reality room can you provide a little bit of information about that how did that idea come up and I know it's about five years ago you came up with this and you're one of the creators of this great project what would how did that come up okay well I was working with our IT director a guy called Luke Brace Girdle who's very smart with his IT and we started with the avatars and what we thought about was um, when you're looking at a small screen or a computer, um, sometimes it's not as involving as you'd like it to be. We thought, wouldn't it be great if you could have an immersive experience? So we looked at the technology available and we discovered, um, certainly within the car industry, that they were starting to use caves. So we investigated this technology and it is, you can probably see on the screen behind exactly. me now, yeah, a cube. Behind that cube is actually relatively simple. It's just com computers with projectors that, that, that, that throw images back, project them onto the wall with mirrors to stop shadows coming in. You can put the 3D glasses on, walk into the cave, and experience any 3D environment you want to create. So basically, anything that provides a digital output becomes a digital input. So we have our whole hospital ward, we can have a family doctor's office, we have a pharmacy, um, you could put a human, body. a human body in there, output for an MRI scan, x-rays, you name it. Yeah, you can actually show uh, in the presentation, most likely it's in the background right now, instead of showing the scans of the brain, you can basically go one by one, you right? Yeah. So you can slice it do and around and all this. How many people can fit in this cave? At the moment, uh, in the cave we have, you can have about half a dozen people inside the cave. Half a dozen. And about 20 people outside the cave watching. And that's how we tend to use this as a teaching tool. So one group will go in, the others will be observers, and they swap over. And each time you change the program just slightly, so nobody does exactly the same thing. Amazing that that's too. That's a small thing about technology. Yeah. But of course, it's, it, the joy of things like the cave is, is very flexible. So as well as teaching you clinical skills, 
you can use it for teaching your chemistry and your pharmacology. Um, as I've said, the nature of medicine is changing, so we're going from small chemicals to big protein molecules. The medicines of the future are going to be big proteins. And these are very hard to conceptualize because they're three-dimensional. But if you put them into the cave, you can see them as they are. And immediately it's obvious how these things work. So, great teaching tool. Uh, great. So, what is, do you think, the next phase of it? You know, we are, we're hearing a lot about Oculus, Rift, all of these. Uh, what do you think about those new technology that's coming up? Okay, well, we've, we've exper experimented so far with two forms of new technology. Uh, one is the Z-Space. I don't know if you've seen this. This is a tablet that you put glasses on and you can lift objects with using a stylus. And the other is the Oculus Rift. I think they both have potential. And it's a question of using the right technology for the right effect. So if you want a completely immersive environment, the Oculus Rift is great. I think the challenge with the Oculus Rift at the moment is it's still a little bit first generation technology. Yeah. It's, a little bit chunk, it's a little bit clunky, it's a little bit heavy on the head. Um, and at the moment, the other disadvantage is it's hard to deal with another person. So if I'm in the cave, um, one of the things we do will have say a medical student, a nursing student, a pharmacy student in the cave together discussing one virtual case. Now that's very natural if you stood in a room. If you put the Oculus Rift on and three of you are wearing those, that's not quite so natural. But there are things you can do that would adjust for that. Mm -hmm. So you could, for instance, by using the Oculus Rift, still have the ward, but then have a virtual tutor that you see, yep. the glasses that could come in and help you. Yep. So there's all sorts of developments here. So that would be a lot more inexpensive to, to get yeah. this once it's ready, but it looks like with the cave, you've already gone all five years you've been testing it and it, it works great. It works great like any other technology, you know. It gets, yeah. It, it will get more sophisticated and more sophisticated things will come along without a shadow of doubt. Um, you know, we could be using holograms, we could be using Oculus Rifts or something like or that. Or HoloLens, you know, Microsoft is coming yeah, yeah, up yeah, yeah, or yeah. others. Anything, yeah. anything like that. Um, in, in terms of the expense, I think the cost will come down. Like all technologies, remember, uh, my, the first computer I ever used filled the room and I put punch cards into it. You know, and it was hugely expensive. My phone has more computing power now than that, than that computer, huge computer. Huge computer 20 years ago. The same is going to happen, I'm convinced, with this sort of technology. When we first invested in the cave, it was a significant capital expenditure. Now you could put a cave up for round about £100,000 sterling. £100 sterling. So, which is yeah, not bad. Yeah. And of course, an Oculus Rift, a unit for an Oculus Rift, is a lot less expensive. Of course. Yet. Yeah. And one could see if you wanted to teach a cohort of 60 or 80 students with Oculus Rift, perfect for chemistry, perfect for pharmacology, and maybe it could be adjusted. And maybe, you know, that's something we'll look at in the future. Maybe we'll do a... You can do maybe mix and a, match. A compare and contrast, yeah. do a scientific exactly. study to see strengths and weaknesses of both. Definitely. Sir, it was great to have you on our show. Thank you very much for coming here, spending your time, giving your time for us, provided a valuable information. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Evet, çok değerli bilgiler aldık. Sanal hasta ve sanal gerçeklik üzerine sohbet ettik. Bir sonraki show'da gene çok güzel konularla görüşmek üzere. Hoşça kalın diyoruz.